Association is pleased to present this online seminar, the APSA HFS Council Activities and FHWA Everyday Counts 2 Program Update. My name is David Merritt and I'll be your moderator for today's seminar. Please note that today's broadcast is being recorded. All participant lines will be muted during the broadcast. Today's presentation will be 60 minutes and includes specific questions and answers answer period at the end of the program. However, you can enter a question at any time by simply typing in the chat box and clicking on the send button located next to the box. And now it's my pleasure, pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker will be Mr. Joseph Chung, a civil engineer. Well, Mr. Chung works for the FHWA Office of Safety. He's a registered professional engineer and holds a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Transportation Engineering. He is the team lead for the Everyday Counts 2 High Friction surf Surfacing Treatment. Uh, initiative and is responsible for pavement friction, visibility highway lighting, and focus approach to safety roadway departure implementation and safety program. Our second speaker will be Mr. Robert Dingus, who has worked for on federal and state transportation policy for the past 20 years. After a stint on Capitol Hill as a legislative aide, Mr. Dingus spent nine years as director of the government relations for the American Traffic Safety Services Association. In 2006, Mr. Dingus left ATSA to start Mercer Strategic Alliance Incorporated. In 2011, Mr. Dingus became the president and CEO of the Geospatial Transportation Mapping Association, or GTMA, an industry association focused on maximizing the value of transportation data. A graduate of Brigham Young University, he's currently completing work on a master's degree in transportation policy, operations, and logistics at George Mason University. He serves as chair of ATSA's High Friction Surfacing Council. Welcome to the program. Uh, Joe, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, on behalf of FXWA, uh, we thank you for this opportunity to share with you about high friction service treatment. Um, I'm the program lead for the EDC2 initiative. Today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Everyday Count again, uh, just to provide some background, uh, give everybody up to date as to what's the latest uh, under high friction service treatment, and also want to share with you uh, a clip uh, from our high friction service treatment video that we put, to get, put together. Then we have some time for questions as well. Um, for some of you that are not very familiar with the, our Everyday Count program, I'm just going to give a little quick overview. Um, back, it was launched in 2010, and we call it our EDC-1. Uh, it is to advance a culture of innovation in the highway community in partnership with the states. Through this effort, um, and especially this is, we want to emphasize, it's a state-based effort, FHWA coordinate rapid deployment of proven market-ready strategies and technology to shorten the project delivery process, enhance roadway safety, and improve environmental sustainability. Uh, since 2010, uh, this initiative have already seen drastic results, and um, a lot of the technology that was promoted through the program has been adopted by transportation agency around the nation, and um, some of you probably have seen it uh, while on your everyday travel, things such as uh, Safety Edge or some of the other pavement technology that have been advanced uh, all through the country. Hmm, it seems to have lost the... Okay, the technology itself uh, for the EDC-2 was launched back in fall of 2012. Um, back then there were 13 innovations and there were two summit held, one uh, in the fall of 2012 and the other one in spring of 2013. Again, we're focusing on the time needed to complete highway projects through the use of these new technologies. Um, so far, we've seen a lot of uh, good results. And two of those technologies are safety related. This is the high friction service treatment and the intersection and interchange geometric. Um, we have started to look at the next round of everyday count, which is we call it the round three, we posted the solicitation um, back in February of this year, and we received over 130 initiatives for consideration. Um, sometime early summer, probably within the next couple of months, the selection and the technology 
uh, will be announced and come fall time there will be an actual uh, summit uh, host in eight regions uh, within the country. Some of the things that uh, FHWA have done um, in support of promoting high friction is uh, the technical expert has been around the country uh, providing presentation. Um, we also uh, through our resource center provide some testing support in terms of uh, some of the pavement that is experiencing problems, some of the skidding and the, the wet crash that happens in, amongst most of the state. We have been supporting uh, state DOT and send our uh, friction testing equipment there to take a look at some of the problems to help them evaluate to see whether high friction is a solution to those problems. Uh, we also have conducted demos at some of the state. Uh, two states have been completed so far and they are Oklahoma and Alabama where we actually go in and select some of some crash, some lo some curve location section of it that have a lot of crash history that we feel that high friction service treatment can make a difference. Uh, so far we completed those two states uh, and we will continue to uh, explore in the next couple months uh, working with the state of Washington as well as the state of Illinois and the um, Hawaii to uh, install additional demo area. Uh, one thing that oftentimes we ask, well, how long does high friction service treatment will last and how do you, you know, looking at the benefit and all. So we actually have section of these uh, test beds, I like to call it, installed at the um, NCAT over in Auburn and it's under continuous loading with heavy truck traffic. And we want to see how durable these are. Uh, a report should be out in the fall of this year showing different type of aggregate um, under these testing. Uh, one of the things that we also are doing is uh, basically develop a set of frequently asked questions. These have been posted in the Everyday Count website already as well as some case study. And the last thing under that is we partnered with ETSA to produce an education and construction video. So hope one of the things that um, you know uh, we want to give everyone a quick update as to where we are in terms of uh, how state as uh, as far as how receptive they are in terms of uh, the technology. If you look at this map quickly. Um, yellow stands for state that have at least at least one high friction surface treatment installation, and for some of those that I put a star, those are the state that have uh, over 25 curve locations that have uh, high friction surface treatment installed, um, and they are California, Kentucky, Ohio, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. Some other states also have multiple installations, and they are Florida, Tennessee, Texas, South Carolina, and Rhode Island. Now, most likely, I, I have to say, you know, that's based on the, the best knowledge that we have. So some state may actually perhaps are very progressive in terms of uh, promoting high friction as well, and as may not have been reflected on our map. Uh, the purpose of this. Um, high friction service treatment video is uh, to help provide an overview to the decision maker for the state DOT. You know, what kind of benefit does uh, high friction service treatment bring to the table and how it would help save lives in their state. The other purpose is to serve as an education tool for state safety engineers and the pavement engineer as to how to identify locations for high friction and the proper technique to install high friction surface treatment. The DVD itself um, basically separate into two main menus. One is the high friction surface treatment. Uh, under that, there's an overview, which is about six minutes or so. And that's the one that I'm going to be showing uh, and share that with you. The other portion would be about a full length of it, which is about 21 minutes. And that includes the overview as well. Um, and within the 
full-length video, we also divide into submenu, which allow us to look at, you know, if you happen to be interested in doing the site selection, then you can click on that, and that would take you right to the site selection. Or if you want to look at the application technique, you can do so as well. Um, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and um, just bear with me for a second. I'm going to turn the um, presenting back to Rob, and he's going to run the video for me because I'm having some problem with my desktop. Rob? Over 33,000 people die and roughly 2.4 million more are injured in motor vehicle crashes each year on our nation's roadways. Roughly half of those crashes occur at roadway curves or intersections. Excessive speed and driver inattention often create an environment where friction demand is higher than what can be countered with standard pavement surfaces, resulting in a loss of control. Vehicle friction demand is the level of friction needed to safely perform braking, steering, and acceleration maneuvers. High friction surface treatment, or HFST, addresses this problem by providing enhanced traction. When applied as a spot treatment at high-risk areas, HFST significantly reduces crashes, ultimately saving lives and avoiding injuries. High friction surfacing serves as an excellent speed crash reduction countermeasure. Unlike reconstruction, HFST can be installed immediately on well-maintained pavement surfaces. It does not require years of delays for design, right-of-way acquisition, permitting, and environmental processes, or result in long construction-related corridor impacts. Most installations are completed in just a few hours. These low-cost location-specific treatments dramatically reduce risk factors, providing a cost-effective solution. HFST utilizes a liquid polymer resin binder onto which calcined bauxite aggregate is placed or sprayed. Once applied, surface friction is significantly enhanced when compared to traditional pavement treatments. As pavement friction increases, motorists are provided additional time to adjust speed back within safe parameters. HFST provides this enhanced safety in a manner usually obtained only through expensive and disruptive reconstruction designed at reducing friction demand. HFST is a proven safety countermeasure. Utilized since the early 1970s in Europe, Mexico, South America and Asia, this technology is now being aggressively applied in the United States, resulting in dramatic crash reduction. More importantly, speed-related risk factors are reduced without depending on changes in driver behavior. Each year, more than 28% of all highway fatalities occur at or near horizontal curves. Increasing surface friction at these critical locations saves lives and reduces crashes. Crash data collected to date demonstrates significant crash reduction benefits with the installation of high friction surfaces in the United States and around the world. In Milwaukee, for example, HFST was installed on a ramp that had been the site of 87 crashes in just one year. In October of 2011, HFST was installed since that time, only two crashes have occurred. In Oldham County, Kentucky, there was a horizontal curve that recorded 53 wet and three dry crashes over a three-year period. After treatment, those statistics dropped to five wet and zero dry crashes over the next three years. There are similar stories found all around the country. 
High friction surfacing is valuable as a new speed crash reduction tool. When compared to expensive and time-consuming geometric fixes, high friction surfacing is a low-cost countermeasure, helping to reduce roadway departure crashes and to save lives. The following information can help you learn more about high friction surface treatment installation and pavement friction management. Thank you, Rob. So let me recap a little bit. Well, first of all, I apologize that some of the screen appears to be a little bit choppy. That's because of how we're set up. And uh, what we're going to do, uh, this video will be ready towards the end of June, beginning of July. We will then post it on our Everyday Count website as well as our safety website and uh, you all can uh, take a look at it uh, or that um, you can also download it for your use. Uh, we will also most likely post them on the social media as well um, just so that if people are interested then they can selectively look at uh, a portion of the uh, video. Uh, one of the things that I just want to recap is in terms of the benefit of uh, putting high friction service treatment. It is to reduce crashes, injuries, and fatality. Um, they can be customized to specific state and local safety needs. Um, road owner can use these treatment where they are most needed, such as tooling row row at horizontal curve, area at steep grades, and area um, you know near lane change or at intersection. Um, it's long lasting and compared to geometric improvement, it certainly is going to be a lot cheaper. And the thing is, as because you can install high friction in a matter of one or two days, and sometimes in a matter of one good afternoon. So you just start saving life immediately versus a lengthy construction that could last you about a year and a half, plus tremendous delay in terms of uh, the road user and also the detour and stuff like that, and you could cause secondary crash as well in the work zone. Um, the other thing that um, you know we already talked about where you can apply, and so at this time I'm going to conclude my presentation. And these are the location that you can um, get some more information on high friction service treatment. And certainly, if any of you have additional questions that we cannot answer today, feel free to email me. And I will try to um, either get, get, provide you a response, or if not, I will bring in my technical expert um, to help you as well. So anyway, thank you very much. And uh, have a nice afternoon. Bye bye. Okay, thank you, Jill. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Rob Dingus now, who's going to talk about some of uh, APSA's activities with the High Friction Servicing Council. So, Rob, if you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Dave and uh, Joe. Enjoyed that presentation. Certainly, a lot of work has been going on as it relates to. Uh, high friction surfacing. We've had tremendous leadership from Federal Highways through the EDC2 initiative and uh, the promotion that has occurred from Federal Highways. A ATSA has been aggressively involved in the promotion of high friction surfacing and I just wanted to take a moment and provide an update on some of the ATSA activities. Uh, the High Friction Surfacing Council was formed in uh, April of 2012, so it's a fairly young organization within the ATSA uh, uh, safety technical committee side. And uh, since its formation, uh, we have spent a, a, 
a great deal of our time focusing on uh, the AASHTO NITPEP HFS test deck, developing a place where materials and manufacturers and manufacturer suppliers of the various systems could have their materials tested and, and the results from those tests be uh, circulated to uh, various state agencies. We've also worked with the AASHTO Subcommittee on Materials, Tech Section 4C, to develop a high friction surfacing standard specification. And that has, uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Danny Lane with the Tennessee Department of Transportation and uh, Derek Castle with uh, uh, the Kentucky uh, Transportation Cabinet uh, and others, other state agencies, as well as through federal highways with uh, folks like Frank Julian and Mike Moravic, we've been able to make great progress in developing a standard specification that a number of states are using as a template to, to develop their own specific state specifications. And then, of course, working with, uh, with Joe and through the EDC2 initiative in supporting uh, federal highways efforts there. Another key initiative is centered on our website, the highfrictionsurface.net. And I wanted to take a few minutes and, and walk you through some of the high friction surface .net, uh, uh, tabs and give you a feel for where we're headed with that. Um, basically, this is ATSA's attempt to create a location where you can get a tremendous amount of information in one stop on high friction surfacing. And so, for example, if you click on the HFS map section here, you can go down and, and look at case studies. So if you highlight, for example, Kentucky or West Virginia, and you click on uh, Kentucky on the map, it will pull up a case study uh, regarding locations where high friction surfacing has been installed. It gives you background information. It helps you understand uh, what that agency was, was looking at and why they chose to try high friction surfacing. It gives you this information and it also provides you with contacts. So it's a good location or a good uh, resource for agencies who are working on strategic highway safety plans, who find themselves uh, needing to address horizontal curve or other potential site locations. It gives you contact information so that you can speak to a colleague in another state and to be able to take that information and be able to uh, incorporate that, we feel like is a great resource. As you can see below, there is uh, you can actually submit a case study. And by clicking on this, it'll pull up a form. You simply fill out the information, email it to the staff liaison, Donna Clark, at as you can see here. And then we will get those uh, vetted and then placed on the map. Uh, I, the, the one regret I have is that we don't have more case studies, but we will be working aggressively to get more case studies so that peers can begin talking with peers in other states and, and working with each other. We're excited about our, our FAQ section here. Uh, this, these web uh, pieces that have just gone up, these videos here, uh, were filmed at the ATSA annual meeting and you will for some of you you'll recognize some of the folks here like Frank Julian with Federal Highways, Derek Castle with Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, Joe Chung who spoke to us earlier, uh, Rob Olanowski, Greg Freeman. These are some of the leaders in the industry addressing certain questions in a very uh, quick format as it relates to high friction surfacing. We will be adding to this uh, through the FAQ process uh, writing a lot of, uh, just to have a place where uh, questions that we've received over time, questions that folks like Frank Julian and others have heard as they have made presentations to agencies around the country. So I'd encourage you to, one, look at the different video segments, and then if you have questions, feel free to email me and, or, or Donna Clark or, or someone within uh, ATSA to, and just let us know what questions you would like to have answered as part of our FAQ. On the research side, we are pulling together various research and other documents that, that might be helpful in giving some background. 
Uh, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit later about some other issue, uh, issues and, and ideas as it relates to research, but this is where we plan to put research documents uh, as it relates to high friction surfacing. We also have a number of videos uh, in addition to some of the others that you'll see out there. Um, some great resources here uh, for visuals that you can look at. Let me just very quickly give you a sense of, of the types of things that we're able to, to, that you'll see if you go to that section. New Year's Eve 2011, a father had to rescue his kids from the frigid waters with the help of Good Samaritan. So last summer, UDOT put this high friction pavement on a quarter mile stretch of the road through the curve. That's sort of a lot higher of a friction than we normally see on a typical roadway. They spread out an epoxy and put the grit on top of that, which binds it to the road. That extra grit, if you will, will provide a better opportunity for the tires on the car to, to hold and as they come around this corner. The UHP tells me that in the two years prior to putting down this surface, they had as many as 30 slide-offs right in this area. Since then, only a couple. And you can feel the friction just from dragging your foot from the old pavement to the new pavement. As you can tell, these are the these are the kind of press and other promotional type pieces that can be helpful in explaining to agencies and policymakers the importance of high friction surfacing and the and the reason why there's been such a tremendous effort from the Federal Highway Administration, AASHTO, and APSA in in moving this process along. State specifications is another area on the website. Um, we will be uh, posting state specifications, the, as you can see here, as they become available to serve as a resource not just uh, to other agencies but also to uh, manufacturers and installers so that they'll have a place where they can go and get the latest information on what is the standard specification for the various states. Our, our press location here has a number of what I would call print media uh, as it relates to high friction surfacing. High friction surfacing makes for a pretty good press. Uh, we've noticed that there have been a, there's been a tremendous amount of coverage throughout the country, uh, primarily because you, you're, they're usually installed in places where there has been a significant number of crashes, and it's certainly the agencies are very proud of their efforts in addressing this, uh, especially as data starts to come in, showing a tremendous progress. We've also been able to work with the Federal Highway Administration and within APSA to develop a number of products that are designed to help educate, again, policymakers and agencies on high friction surfacing and the various types of materials that can be or that can be used and the locations that it can be used. Over time, we will continue to add new publications to this section. So where do we go from here? Well, ATSA is working on a number of specifications. Specifically right now, we're focused on providing uh, or developing a standard specification for green for bicycle lanes. There is a, a concerted effort, uh, as I'm sure most of you have seen now, if you've, if you've been driven in cities, you will see these green bicycle lane uh, that are down on the road trying to uh, provide additional safety and, and visibility to those who are riding bicycles within the cities and even beyond the cities. So we're working on a standard specification there. We have been working to pull together a uh, material in, in lieu of a standard specification for, say, green for the bicycle lane, we are trying to at least provide information on who are the installers of these materials, who are the manufacturers, where can you go to get more information. In the next few weeks, we will have a listing of the uh, ATSA members who provide these materials, so at agencies will have a place where they can go and find uh, information about good quality manufacturers with great reputations and those who install the material. The same will be occurring for both red for transit lanes and purple for toll lanes. We have also established a research uh, group that is looking at potential 
uh, research topics. As I'll give you just a few examples. We, we recently had a task force conversation about this. One of the questions that comes up quite a bit is, where does a curve begin and where does it end? Where should we ins begin installing high friction surfacing? Well, right now, we really don't have a great answer for that. We have a number of answers, but we do not have a lot of research that, that would, is helpful in this area. And so that, there are a number of questions like that as it relates to finding high friction surface locations and how to use and, and apply these materials. So we're working in that area. Training is another area. We do not have, this is an industry that does not have good training yet as it relates to, for inspectors as, uh, and for those who will be installing the materials. And so training is an issue that ATSA is looking at. With that, Dave, I'll turn it back over to you. I think we have certainly plenty of time for questions. So if there, we do have questions, we'll go from there. Okay, thank you, Rob. All right, well, that really concludes our uh, our presentations uh, for this webinar. And uh, so now it's, it's time for a question and answer period. And I uh, just encourage you to uh, go ahead and uh, type any questions in the chat box. I don't I think I see any yet, but uh, go ahead and, and type those in, and we'll, we'll try to answer those the best I can. Um, I do want to compliment uh, Rob Dingus and brag on him for a little bit. Uh, really, a lot of the activities, uh, the successes of this High Friction Surfacing Council have been to the, the uh, just the tremendous efforts of, of Rob to keep this council moving, uh, getting the video out there, uh, training materials. You mentioned the Ashto spec that was developed by the council. Uh, so Rob, really, really appreciate all your hard work there. Uh, you've really helped to advance things, and we're just really uh, thankful that we have a home, an industry home for high friction surfacing. Uh, within that, so. Well, I appreciate that, Dave. But I would, I would actually say that one of the reasons why we've been so successful, you know, ATSA, when we brought this issue of high friction surfacing to ATSA, uh, through all of the the technical committees, the membership committee, the board of directors of ATSA, uh, we received uh, tremendous support. We were able to organize this very quickly. Uh, ATSA's executive director, Roger Wentz and uh, the ATSA staff provided uh, help to facilitate this process, to bring the, the folks together, a very seamless process in allowing this group to, to work and to come together. And we would be nowhere if it was not for the tremendous support we received from Federal Highways and from AASHTO, who recognized very quickly that this was a life-saving technology that had um, that, that had real merit and real promise and have been tremendously supportive. And so uh, with, with their assistance and uh, from what you've seen today uh, from Federal Highways and the EDC2 initiative, um, this, we've just had tremendous support. I guess just in, in conclusion, uh, and if we don't have any questions, I would just make one um, final point. In the absence of a strong inspector training in the absence of uh, even the standard spec, which is still kind of working its way through the process. And as states begin to develop their standard specifications, I would strongly encourage those states that are working on this to take advantage of those who have been working on this process. So folks like Joe Chung and Frank Julian and Mike Moravic with Federal Highways, to, to certainly get in touch with your colleagues like Danny Lane with Tennessee and Derek Castle with, uh, with uh, Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. Talk to your colleagues as you're developing your standard specifications. And, and to be aggressive in enforcing your specifications. This is a material that will be installed in horizontal curves. It's going to be installed in high-risk locations. We need to make sure that those materials are installed correctly, that no shortcuts are permitted, especially at a time where we're just at the beginning phase of this. And, and Joe, I, I'm not sure how you feel about that, but I have been tremendously impressed with the emphasis that Federal Highways has placed on quality and on uh, working very hard to support good quality installation 
and at every turn when there has been a question about uh, whether to, to look for lower cost or higher cost materials, that the emphasis has been on getting this right and then making it any adjustments that need to be made after we have experience rather than trying to see how close we can get to the, to the edge. But I would strongly encourage those who are listening or who watch this presentation, if you're an agency, talk to your colleagues and, and counsel with them and draw upon their experience. Because as you'll see in the video that has been put together and by Federal Highways, it is extremely important that process is followed as it relates to evaluating the condition of the pavement, evaluating the locations, making sure that it is installed correctly, that all of these things are followed. And uh, this is certainly not something where you want to try and cut corners. Yeah, uh, Rob, I, I couldn't agree more on this. The fact is that, um, you know, we high friction survey treatment, you know, in, in the first few years where states start to consider it, uh, one of the things that the last thing we want is to basically have them try it and have a uh, unsuccessful installation for whatever reason. It could be because of temperature, it could be because of the preparation of service, or not repairing the, the structure under element of the pavement. Uh, or for that matter, it could be just as simple as not mixing the um, binding uh, material properly. And that could lead to failure. So um, here at Federal Highway felt that it's very important to get the word out there as to what is the proper way to prepare the material before uh, they are applied to the ground service and what are the ultimate temperature and what are the do's and don'ts. And that's one of the whole purpose of this, uh, we call it education video, is for folks to truly understand, you know, the technology and where best to apply high friction and how to select the location, how to identify the limit. I think the, the, the video uh, really, you know, fit the purpose well and I think uh, the education component is there and truly we feel that this is a technology that can save lives and uh, high, high friction service treatment uh, you know we have stated it has been tried overseas and have been tried but not necessary with the, the right type of aggregate uh, what we are promoting are the aggregate that are durable long-lasting resistant to polishing and is really is really a spot location treatment, not a um, resurfacing type of treatment. So uh, we're definitely on board, and we also want to thank uh, Etsa for providing a lot of the support um, throughout the the uh, putting together of this video, uh, as well as in other area to promote uh, high friction service treatment. Yeah, well, definitely we second everything that that uh, both of you have said, and. Uh, it looks like we do have some questions now uh, from the audience, and uh, with that, I'm going to ask Tammy Loving with uh, ATSA to go ahead and read off some of those questions, and we'll we'll uh, answer those questions for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, who was the narrator on the video? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> uh, that was uh, uh, ATSA's Jim Barron was the uh, narrator on that video. Okay. The next question is, what's the cost? Okay, um, and, and I think, Dave, you can chime in as well. Uh, the range that we're seeing uh, is around 35 to $40 a square yard, and then sometime it would also drop to close to $20 a square yard. I think it all depends on location, depends on the type of a polymer that you selected, as well as uh, mechanical insulation versus hand insulation. And a couple of things that you can do also is high friction really is you do not need a general contractor to do the work for you. You can go directly to some of these installer and supplier and they they can manage the job and so you kind of cut out the middleman. So in essence that will help you reduce the cost. Yep. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Joe. And I, I, I think what we're seeing now with, with a lot of states where they're seeing the best pricing is is when they let several curves. So you know, 20 or 30 uh, 
curves to be treated under one project, uh, they're seeing some really good prices uh, when they do that versus uh, just one one individual curve. There's certainly some mobilization cost associated with that, but I think that uh, price range is, is about right. Anything from uh, 20 on up to 30 or 45, just depending again on the size of the project, uh, how much materials required, and uh, location would be a factor too. Well, and and I would just say that there are some who try to compare the cost to other uh, surface treatments. I think that's a wrong analogy to try to compare the cost to other surface treatments because I think that the better comparison is to compare it to a redesign. And so when you look at these curves and you start looking at cost, you have to ask yourself, what would it cost to fix this curve, to, uh, to, to work on the super elevation or, to, to, or to, take, uh, to straighten the curve? When you start running those numbers and when you think about what it costs uh, you, I mean, if you have to do a redesign, you're talking all the environmental components, all the delays, all the time that it takes. Um, this is something that doesn't need any of those things and can be put down fairly quickly. You can have a pretty quick turnaround on this. You don't have to do a myriad of uh, environmental reviews, et cetera, because you're going to be busting up the road or having to, 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 to break ground somewhere. So if we if you compare this to a surface treatment, well, that's I just think it's the wrong comparison. The reason this is called high friction surfacing is because it is a higher friction number than you could get with anything else that's out there right now. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And it, you know, too, it's not as Joe mentioned, it's not a pavement preservation treatment. It is a, a safety treatment. Um, you're not going to see a pavement preservation benefits to it. It is specifically to help uh, reduce crashes by improving friction. All right, Tammy, any other questions? Yes. Will the training course that you develop include installation and inspection? Training course? Well, we, yes, the, the, we go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Well, I, I would say that since we haven't developed an outline for that yet, I think it's a little premature to know exactly what we will have in it. But initially, I know we have talked about the idea that an inspection course is, is important. We want to make sure that agencies are getting what they pay for, and that they have the tools they need to be able to go out and make sure that they are able to both evaluate the, the site location, to know that before they let a bunch of projects that the site location meets certain criteria, and also that they're able to be sure that what they get is what they have paid for. Uh, Rob, um, that's something that perhaps down the road, uh, Federal Highway can also coordinate with uh, ESSA on this matter. We are also uh, engaging a consultant to uh, take a look at several sites as to you know come up with a way to best identify uh, problem curves for high friction service treatment as well as uh, how to determine the limit of installation as well. So those would be good information to include in a training uh, class. The other thing that we are um, uh, looking into is um, actually um, putting together a training in terms of doing performing testing of friction uh, on streets and, and roadways. So that would be also be a very com important component of uh, you know in ensuring proper installation as well as uh, the before and after um, friction number for comparison. Certainly needed. Yeah, thank you, and that's one of the focuses of the uh, education task force under the uh, ATSA High Friction Surfacing Council. And so, I encourage everyone in the audience to get involved with ATSA and get involved in the High Friction Surface Council. All right, Tammy, uh, another question. How long do surface treatments typically last, given salting and plowing during the winter time? Um, some of the the insulation have not been down that long, so uh, but for some of the typical insulation that are that are not in subject to a lot of snow plowing, we're talking about seven to ten years. Some last a little longer. Now, for I have heard from a webinar that for some of the area that uh, have um, you know a lot of snow and uh, subject to 
a fairly lengthy winter season snow plowing with bare pavement policy. Um, the friction testing number shows that initially they are in the high 70s and 80s and then after one or two seasons they still are in the low 60s and upper 50s. I've actually had some uh, agency folks tell me that they specifically went out and tried to beat this stuff up and uh, uh, without much success. They're pretty pleased with what they're ending up with after after the, the uh, snow season. Yeah, and just to, to add to that, I think it's a, it's a combination of a lot of things, uh, the, the amount of traffic you have on it, again, the, the type of environment it's exposed to. Uh, but there's a lot of, similar to the cost, there's a lot of factors that would go into play um, Terms of how long it performs, but we've seen good, very good performance in cold climates and uh, as well as warm climates. Okay, okay Tammy, and another question. Can the same epoxy be applied to concrete surfaces? Yes. Um, basically, uh, you can apply uh, high friction surface treatment, you know, the aggregate and the polymer to both. Um, you know, concrete surface as well as asphalt surface. It's just a matter, the, the only difference is, uh, is the treatment of the surface. Um, for example, you have to uh, probably clean this, the concrete surface with um, shot blasting and all uh, before you then put the uh, polymer and then the aggregate down. And then to add to, to, add to what uh, Joe said, uh, that's one of the things that we're going to have in the, uh, the video is some guidance on uh, surface preparation for different treatments. All right, Tammy, uh, another question. Are there any, oh, I'm sorry, how much noisier is an HFS treated road than a standard pavement? Yeah, Dave, didn't you have a kind of like a brief study on that, on one of the locations? Well, we did, we did some testing on a couple of projects and uh, the, the noise difference was not uh, uh, really that discernible. Uh, what, you'll, what, you, what you could hear, uh, for example, going from a, a concrete pavement with transverse high friction would be uh, going from maybe a high-pitched wine surface to more of a, a low, uh, lower frequency uh, type, type noise. So it's really, it's, uh, really not more noisy, if you will, uh, than a conventional pavement surface. It depends what you're going from type of surface you're going from. Uh, it's certainly probably not going to be as quiet as like an open graded surface, but um, there's, there's not a really good, uh, I guess, estimate for the, the difference in noise. Um, but I would say that it's, it's something you'll notice a difference when you hit the high friction after you've come off of a conventional pavement surface, but it's not something that's uh, annoying uh, or uh, a nuisance noise, if you will. So it's one thing to keep in mind to the section that we are looking at, for example, we're not installing miles and miles of high friction service treatment. Most likely sometime it may be a thousand feet around the curve area and or on the on and off ramp, maybe part of the on ramp and part of the off ramp. So the duration, the length of it is not that long. So let's say you're traveling at 40 miles per hour, so within about 20 seconds. Uh, you basically go right back to regular pavement. So it's really hardly noticeable as you drive through it. Yeah, that's a good point, Joe. Thank you. All right, Tammy, any other questions? Are there any accepts that acceptance testing specification standards in regard to testing these surfaces for sufficient friction after application or construction? Dave? Yeah, there's uh, in the ASHTO spec that uh, we developed. Uh, certainly, the the main thing that we we're concerned with is the frictional resistance. And uh, so there was great debate developing that spec in terms of which uh, which test standard do we use. Uh, we really settled with what's uh, primarily used throughout the U.S., which is the locked wheel trailer. But we do recognize that there are uh, states that don't operate locked wheel trailer, and there there may be uh, sections of roadway where you cannot use a locked wheel trailer, a very sharp curve in that. So um, that, that, was, that was really what we settled on for the, for the, uh, the, the specification. Okay. I heard bauxite as one of the aggregate materials. What were the others? 
Well, you know, um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak as far as um, under the EDC2 high friction survey treatment program, we're talking about something that's highly durable and, sub and uh, resistant to polishing. So through testing, we're considering uh, bauxite, which have a friction number of uh, PSV of uh, over 70. So, and the specification that we work with, working with ESTO, also uh, pointed out of using bauxite as the acceptable aggregate. Now, we're not close-minded. If there are other aggregates out there that can uh, provide the same property, same uh, polishing resistance, then we can certainly consider that uh, be acceptable. Now, there are some other states where um, they wanted to use the native material, and perhaps they are satisfied with a lower polishing val uh, PSV, and that may not last as long, then they would certainly use that and, um, you know, as a substitute. But one thing that I wanted to point out is the cost of high friction surface treatment. The major component is the epoxy, is the polymer. Um, so why would you want to put down a, a inferior aggregate um, and end up not last as long? So that would be, you know, uh, one thing that you need to keep in mind. Absolutely agree with what Joe said. We're talking refractory grade calcine bauxite. We're not. T if you want to put down something else, it's it is not a high friction surface. It may be a, an enhanced friction surface. It may be better than what you have, but it's not a high friction surface. And you have to ask yourself: polishing over time, value over time. Um, you know, right now we're in the initial stages of this. You know, five years from now. Somebody may decide they want to try to use other aggregates, and that's fine. But I would agree with Joe. What's the point when most of the money in this is in the epoxy and in the process of installation? Why would you go with something that may polish on you and actually reduce the safety benefits? At least for now, high friction surfacing means refractory grade calcine bauxite as the aggregate. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, Tammy, another question. Question for Rob. How does one get involved in the ATSA HFS Council? Well, that's a great question. We have two meetings a year. Uh, 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 the ATSA mid-year meeting is coming up in August. If you go to ATSA.com and look at the meetings piece, you can certainly do that. You can contact Donna Clark. We showed the email, her email address earlier. If you go to highfrictionsurface.net, you can send me an email at rdingus at mercerstrategic.com. Um, it's basically open to all ATSA members uh, through the, uh, as far as high, the High Friction Surfacing Council. We also, for the broader community beyond the ATSA family, everyone has access to highfrictionsurface.net. So you can certainly get involved there. Uh, we have a lot of task forces that are meeting on a lot of different issues. So. We have tried to create a lot of information and, and, and have it publicly available, but we are certainly open to, uh, to more participation. Okay. I'll take a minute, Rob. What type of aggregates are used for the HFS T course? Uh, yeah, that, that goes back to the calcine bauxite. Right. Okay. Are the materials prioritary? Do they have square yard cost estimates for construction? Is there any data regarding long-term maintenance and durability? I think we, we can't answer that as far as longevity. How long does it last as well as, well as uh, what type? Uh, it's not proprietary. Um, you know, we have uh, the box, box type. Some of them are produced. In the United States, some uh, produce actually overseas. Uh, it's a process; it's an added process to the to the natural material. So they're definitely not proprietary. The one firm that's going to supply the bauxite material is going to be the same as others. Um, Sometimes they may have may be a slightly different uh, in terms of uh, a slightly different shade. That's about it. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, to just to add to Joe's comment, really the propri any proprietary nature of high friction really comes from whatever binder is used. Uh, that's really uh, where you'd see uh, uh, trade trade names for, for different types of materials, the epoxy or the polymeric resins that are used. Okay. Any thoughts regarding friction testing equipment and calibration of that equipment? I think, Dave, you touched on that a little bit, didn't you? Yeah, again, uh, when we, we were developing the ASHTO spec, we were, we were trying to uh, be sure that we're, we're considering what type of equipment's out there and available. And uh, again, uh, we really primarily settle with a locked wheel trailer for acceptance testing. Uh, but there are other uh, portable devices, such as dynamic friction tester, that could be used if you're on a, a curve that's just too sharp uh, for a locked wheel trailer. Uh, there's other continuous friction testing devices such as uh, the highway friction tester and the uh, grip tester. Um, but really, I, I think that's one of the reasons we base the spec around what we're, uh, most states are using, which is the locked wheel trailer. Um, calibration of those devices, that's, there's, you know, calibration is all standardized. Uh, ASTM has standard E274 for, for uh, calibration of the uh, locked wheel trailer. Uh, it has all the requirements for calibration in there. I would say that also from, from, well, from an ATSA standpoint, we are strong supporters of states developing comprehensive pavement friction management programs. And there's great uh, resources at Federal Highway's website uh, uh, on the, how to create these. There's an NCHRP report on how to create these. But one of the problems we have right now is we have a lot of friction testing devices. We don't have a very good process for um, not so much calibration, but but how to um, correlate a lot of the data that's coming from that. Okay. okay. How often do you have to reapply? Well, as we as we talked earlier, um, you know, typically we see um, some of the the. Uh, treatment lasts between seven to ten years and obviously uh, the state need to have a friction management program where they can do testing I mean that's that's pretty much the the only way you can tell whether um, you know the friction number have gone down or start to to wear out okay. well the other thing is if you all of a sudden start to experience crash again then yeah yeah, and I think it's, it's to add to that, I think it's uh, maybe the best way is just to monitor, certainly you monitor crashes, but monitor friction over time. That would give you some indicator when it needs to be reapplied. I think we have time for maybe one more question, Tammy. Okay. Um, I have a bunch of them, but um, have you been able to try HFS on Alaska highways? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that Alaska have installation this year, and I believe has been quite successful. So yes, uh, they actually have installation over in Alaska. Yeah, and if you can do it in Alaska, you can do it just about any place. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. It's a tough. Those roads are beat up pretty bad. Okay. Let, Dave, if I could, just at the conclusion of this, let me just say that, you know, we've seen this before. We've had technologies that have come along that have been game changers. We've had rumble strips and their ability to for drowsy driving to make a real difference. We've had cable guardrail, which after the uh, enactment of the Highway Safety Improvement Program was installed and did a tremendous uh, improvement as it relates to uh, head-on collisions uh, and divided highways. We have a 25% of our fatal crashes occurring at horizontal curves. And this is a tremendous opportunity with what we know about crash reductions from high friction surfacing to make a real difference. And so this is an exciting time, both from an industry standpoint, I would imagine, Joe, from a federal highway standpoint and an AASHTO standpoint, to really be able to aggressively go after uh, an issue that has really been troublesome. Uh, that is the uh, crashes at horizontal curves and at, and at troubling intersections. So we're just very excited within the ATSA family and the High Friction Surfacing Council to be able to, to work on this and 
you will see more of these types of webinars and, and, and educational pieces in the future. Thank you, Rob. That's a great way to conclude the webinar. And I uh, do appreciate Rob and Joe, both of you, uh, presenting this, uh, this webinar today. I uh, apologize that we're not able to get to more questions, but please go to highfrictionservices.net and look at the FAQs. As Rob said, we, we spent a lot of time developing uh, those FAQs to try to answer a lot of these common questions. So uh, please visit that website, and you can watch some of those video snippets, and there's also some written questions there. Uh, and with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and conclude today's uh, webinar. Really thank you for your participation in the webcast. Uh, just as a reminder, today's uh, program is copyright uh, 2014 by the American Traffic Safety Services Association with all rights reserved. Uh, this concludes today's program. program. Uh, you may now disconnect. Thank you. Thank you. As we lock off now. Joe, we're done. Okay, excellent, thank you. Excellent job. Hey, thanks, thanks for Dave. your help. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tammy. All right, thank, you. thank you guys. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks.
set it up that way. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Who would... Yeah. I mean, so the question asked is that we already answered that, you know? So, yeah. And you don't even know... know